this is new with these combines. We didn't have this on the 700 series. So instead of the chains, we've got very wide belts up here. And they've got lugs on the back side of them. And you'll notice they're not as tall as the chains. So on the chain, I can actually stick two fingers between the skin of the drum and the slat. These, I can only stick one finger between. So they sit much closer to the skin of the drum. And that's gonna prevent them from, if they do get into, if, you're, if you are into fields with rocks, that's gonna prevent them from bending so far back that they go over center and really bend, and then you run into some issues there with getting the chain in a bind. But these aren't gonna bend as much on here as they would on the chains. Um, but if they do bend, it's, you will make sure, of course, that you get a, get a straight one and put back on there. Either straighten it or take it off until you can get a new one. You can run with a portion of these missing until you get new ones. Um, the problem with bent, bent slats is a bent slat is a shorter slat, and when it bends, it's pulling in on the chains or the belts, and it'll get them in a bind. So if you don't have a, if you don't have a spare one, just take the bent one off so you're not putting the, uh, the uh, belt or chain in a bind. Now, tension-wise on this belt or chain, we always tension those. We always measure them when the drum is in the down position. Because what we want to do is when it's in the down position, we want to look back inside here and the belt and the slat that's the third and fourth slat back should either be barely touching the floor or just off the floor. There's not really any, in the owner's manual, doesn't mention any actual value of the tolerance, but just either barely touching the floor to slightly off the floor. So in the past, what I've done with a, when, with a chain, how I demonstrate it is I would take a pry bar, it's, you can't do it with the, with the belts because the slats are too close, but on a, pry, on, a, on a feeder house conveyor with a chain, I'd take a pry bar over the six o'clock one, go under the second one, push down and let go, and if the chain just tapped the floor, it was good. If it didn't touch the floor, it was probably too tight, or if it laid on the floor, it's too loose. Um, and that's on the chain with the drum and the down position. I can't really do that with this one because I can't get a, I can't get a pry bar back to the second one because it's too close together, but that's, that's no problem. If you look back inside here, and I can see just barely that third slat, you've got just a little bit of a sag, and I can't see it really touching back there, although when they come out of the factory, the belts and chains are going to be a little bit tighter than, than what we are accustomed to once we've been running in the field or when we tension them ourselves. So this one is a little bit tighter. Uh, I wouldn't back it off. I'd just leave it alone and, and, and let it run for a couple days and then go back and check it. Now the thing about belts on a combine is the first week is the most important because that's where all your initial belt stretch takes place and chain stretch. So it's really important on these new combines during that first week that we inspect them. I'd inspect them for the first week at the end of every day. Um, if, you want to, if you need to make an adjustment, make an adjustment, but you could probably get by doing it every other day during that first week. That's important. After the first week, first 50 hours or so, 40 to 50 hours, you don't have to be quite as intense, but you do want to stay on top of the tension uh, of the belts. So I always tension them slightly more than I would the chains, uh, just a little bit more than the chains. If you look under in, at this one, this is about optimal what I see here. I see just barely, you get a flashlight, you can really see it, just barely a little bit of sag. You got to have some sag, you got to have some slack so that belt expands. Now the advantage of the belts over the chains they're a lot less sensitive to rocks and other foreign debris. So their breaking point is much higher than what a chain. A chain can only flex so much before it snaps. Belts don't really, aren't really gonna snap under the conditions that we're getting, that the rocks or anything that are gonna get underneath there. Um, so they last quite a bit longer, up to twice as long as what chains last. So they are very resilient. When you do have to change them, here's the master connect right here. You got the clamps on each belt and just unbolt them and then just treat them like a chain. You can hook the new belts if you want to these and thread the old one out and the new one in um, just like you would on a, uh, on a chain. Now if you do happen to notice when you take your feeder house off, if you haven't stayed on top of the tension and uh, you notice one of the slats is out of time, you, tension, you get it back into time the same way. 
Uh, I don't want to let it run like that because that's putting a bind. Whenever you see this slat on either the right side or the left side angled down, and most of the time it's the ones on the outside, whichever one is angled down, the rest of them are trying to drift that way. So you got it in a bind and the rest of them are trying to drift towards that one that's jumped out of time because it's kind of the one it's leading. It's two, a couple cogs ahead of the rest of them. So it's trying to pull on the rest of them. So we got to get that back into time. The easiest way to do it is either you can go up underneath the feeder house, take the, take the bolts out on the side that allow access to the top shaft and you can see the, the spoked wheels right up there and take yourself uh, about a 32 mil deep well socket, preferably impact, they're a little larger, and stick, in, stick a couple of them in between the spokes and then go over and rotate your feeder house drive or backwards to bring them back up into time. I would recommend, I would, uh, I would loosen the, the tension off the belts so that they will follow the spokes back around. Sometimes if, you, if they're still too tight, you'll just spin that spoke inside that belt and you won't pull it back in time. So loosen the tension off so you can pull that, back, that belt back in time. You can either do it from here, up underneath, or lay on top and take your door off and there's a transition plate that pops off right there. You can unbolt it and you can look down on whatever you're comfortable with. If you're comfortable with looking up, in, uh, up above and stuff coming down in your eyes, do the bottom. Otherwise, you can go in through the top. It's your preference. I go in through the top. So, and then I just lay up there and I'll have, a, and I'll put the, the deep well, I usually do two at a time, put a deep well socket on the top and then I come over here to the side or have somebody stand here and just rotate. It's real, it's a lot easier to rotate this new one. I can do it here, I don't have to go to the variator. I can just rotate the idler sprocket on the, on the left side of the feeder house to uh, rotate, actually I went the wrong direction. I'd go this way and bring it back, start rolling it backwards to bring it back into time. Any data yet on life expectancy on house belts? Uh, oh, it's variable. I mean, whatever you had on chains, double it. So about twice the, twice the life of chains. So um, I don't, uh, there's not really any. Uh, there's not really any patch kit for it. No, uh, no half link, if you will. You have to make sure they all stay the same length. Um, I'm not a big fan of, of half links um, because, especially on like feeder house chains. I mean, you take the half link, put a new half link in there, take one out and put a half link in. Your strongest length is that link, uh, link is that half link. The rest of them become the weak link. So. If by the time it's by the time your feeder house you're down to putting half links in your feeder house chain, your feeder house chain shot. So might as well get rid of the feeder house, get a new one in there if you're if you're resorting to half links. And that's pretty much on any drive chain too. So, um, but again, there is no patch, no half link kit, if you will, for these belts. So once they're stretched, they're stretched, and it's time to put new ones in there. So, but uh, any questions on that? The key on the belts is that first week, stay on top of your tension. Your tensioners are here on the side. They're a lot easier to get to than, the, uh, than way back when, when we had the, uh, prior to the hydraulic cylinders, uh, just two 24 mil bolts or, or wrenches uh, to adjust those nuts. Now to get your drum in the up position is exactly the same way as it was on the yellow combines. You got your two jam nuts on the left, right side. Uh, just, uh, just loosen your jam nuts out. Pull your face plate back though, so you don't want it all the way forward. By pulling it back gives you more clearance in here to, I usually take a deep well, a 24 mil deep well socket, loosen the outside nut, and then line it up and stick it on to get the inside, loosen it up, and then just take a pry bar in here and lift up, and then rotate the block from horizontal to vertical to the up position. So there's no button in the cab for that? No, nope. no. Nope. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> We're working on something, we, we are working on something different that'll make it, it's index is easier, so you just take a ratchet. So that's, that's coming. And that should just be by that different block and put it on here. And then you can just use a, like a half inch ratchet and do that instead of having to, having to come out here with a pry bar. So that, that, is, that is down the road. One other thing too, so how do you know if your belts are too tight or chains are too tight? Well, on either side of the feeder house, 
you've got this pressure roller uh, coming through. This is the pressure roller that's between the chains that's part of your cruise pilot. So if you get too tight on your belt, what's gonna happen is your belt might pull up on your pressure roller. So if you see any daylight underneath this rubber stop, your belts are probably too tight and are lifting up on that pressure roller. So you wanna back them off and lower them back down so that you get this, this sensor back into range for your cruise pilot. When this sensor gets out of range, the alarm that you'll sometimes see in the cab is either left hand or right hand performance monitor faulty, and that's all on, that's your cruise pilot. Now if it is down and you happen to get that message on Cebus, what you might have is you might have some residue built up between the plate that the, flan that's, uh, the, that the uh, bearings attached to and the sidewall of the feeder house, and it might be going up but not coming back down. So just take an air compressor and blow all that crap out of there and get that cleaned out. Um, might put some lubricant back in there if you want, that's your choice, but that's usually what it is. It's usually hanging up in here. It's not, it's not your sensor that's bad. It's just it's operating out. One side's working correctly, the other one's hanging up, and it's gonna throw, you, throw that fault out there. So, so make sure that stays clean right there too. Um, your brake up here, your header brake. Now remember, this is, a, this is a drum brake, so it's gonna wear. So when you disengage your feeder house, don't mash on either one of the buttons. You'll hear it, you'll know when it sets off because if you push the button on the joystick all the way in or mash down on the button on the console, you're gonna hear that break. Just tap either one of those, just, just gently tap them to shut the header off. If you push in a button firmly, like say you're engaging the unloading system, you're gonna activate this brake. So you don't wanna activate that brake periodically. This is part of the of the auto crop flow. It uses this to uh, shut the header and feeder house off quickly um, if the, in case the combine gets overloaded. So, so you wanna make sure that that keeps working. So just remember when you shut your header or feeder house off, unless it's an emergency, just tap, tap the button on the joystick or just hit the toggle switch, tap it on the console. Don't mat, anytime you mash down on them, you'll apply that brake. So let's go ahead and move, oh, right here. Uh, an another new item on the combine. So, so here's your disawning plate lever. That's always been on all Lexian combines. When it's down, it's open. So you got your 30% pre-separation going on. When it's up, it's closed. You're forcing everything underneath the threshing cylinder. This lever here is to the rock trap and it does have different positions so you can index it to make it more convenient for you. Uh, braise it all the way up. When I pull down on it, I open the rock trap and there's an ejector rod in there. So I don't have to crawl underneath the feeder house anymore and dig that rock trap out and, and sit in that material. I just stand here on the side and work it three or four times, pushing all that residue out onto the ground. Now you can also prop it open. There's a kickstand right there that holds your rock trap open. Just remember, when the, you, that, that you're only gonna get it open all the way when the feeder house is up. The feeder house will touch that door when its kickstand is engaged. So if your kickstand is engaged and you lower your feeder house down, you can imagine what's gonna happen. You're gonna need to buy new linkage because you'll, you will not be able to straighten any of that. It'll twist it. So if your kickstand is down, holding your door open when your feeder house is up and you forget about it and you lower the feeder house down to pick up a header, you just, closed the door and bent all your linkage right here. So remember that. Make sure you keep this flipped up and closed all times. So I don't want you to mess up this linkage. It's gonna to be tough to keep that closed until you get the, get the new parts in there to, to fix that. So that's, that's everything on the, on the feeder house. Let's move back here to the, to the right side of the combine. Tracks are still the same. Uh, the only really maintenance point here, I'll talk to, talk to you about the tracks on it. Auto Lube does get the tracks, uh, the, the, the pivoting uh, um, zerks that are greasing the pivot points. The one thing you might want to do is on your drive shaft, um, probably once a year, I disconnect it, make sure it slides in and out. It can get memory, memory meaning it gets dirt and residue in there and it's going to want to kind of gum up and doesn't want to move. <clears throat> and that would be on any, any type of uh, drivetrain like this. 
Um, so just disconnect it, grease it, move it in and out, make sure it, move, it, it it's telescopic, it's not gummed up. That way it's not going to get in a bind when, uh, when it's going down the road, rotating, or starts to, starts to flex when you're on rough terrain. So just check that. That's about really the only thing you got to do with the tracks. If the track belts start going, start leaking off, you get a warning in the cab. Um, and then uh, there's actually a, a hose and gauge and valve in the toolbox if you want to work on it yourself or, or have it there ready to go for the, the technician if they don't have it. So. But uh, same track, same, all combines now go 25 miles an hour whether wheels or tracks. So you don't have to have tracks anymore to go 25 miles an hour. But the tracks will make it much more comfortable when going 25 mile an hour down the road. So lifespan of the belts is basically the same as duels. So you're going to get a pretty good long life out of them. Now up here is the gearbox that allows us to shift from high to low from the cab. <clears throat> It's a little different from the one we had before. It, uh, it does have some electronics tied to it. You got a shifting rail in there. Uh, so if you're in the cab or if you're standing down here and someone shifts from high to low, you'll hear a thump as that shifting rail moves. And you might see it rotate just a little bit, but that's about all you're gonna see. You'll hear it more than you'll see anything. So um, that's the new gearbox back there. Again, there's no, uh, there, there's, there, to go to neutral, there is a shifting rail up on top. If you need to go to neutral, uh, you can stick a small bolt in there, thread it in there, and then pull it out. Usually use an eye bolt so you can get your finger in there and pull it out. Now remember, whenever you turn the key on, energize the, the system, it's going to snap right back into gear. So you won't be able to hold it out unless you unplug a solenoid to be able to keep it in neutral when the engine's running. This is a newer, larger returns elevator. This is almost as big as the clean grain elevator on a 400 series. Uh, so it's a, it's a very large, higher capacity, new head, larger diameter auger, both on the top and on the bottom, so it can handle a lot of material going up the returns if, if you get into a condition where you need to really use your bottom sieve and, and carry a lot of tailings back to the front. Maintenance-wise, is the same as what it was on all the other combines. Your, your auger drive chain, you just tension it with the idler disc right there, just sliding it backwards to tension the chain, and on the top, You've got your draw bolt to pull up on the chain to tension it, and then of course down here, tension it so you can still slide it side to side on the sprocket with some, with some resistance. You don't want to not be able to slide it. That's too tight, and if it's really loose, it's too, it's, uh, really slides easy, it's too loose. You want to have some resistance both on this chain, returns, and the clean grain elevator chain. And that tension is done down here. I loosen the plate, and then I have my draw bolt down here and I just pull down on the system, on the, on the shaft, until the chain slides side to side with some resistance. You, you want to be able to always move it. Um, so if it moves really sloppily, then it's too loose. If it doesn't move, it's too tight. So you want to have some resistance on there. So that's, that's the, uh, that's the uh, indicator of knowing when you got optimal tension on here. So. We still have the 3D cleaning system. That's what this canister is for. It's not a filter. It's an oil bath pendulum with a shuttle valve on top. So whenever the combine leans to the right or the left, it'll allow, cause that sieve to pivot in there, shaking the grain to the high side so it doesn't drift to the low side and stream out the back of the combine. So up to 11 degrees or 20% slope, it's going to keep the grain evenly distributed on that upper sieve so it doesn't pour out the back. Now right in this area, so you have all your fuel tank. We don't have a left and right side fuel tank anymore. It's all in line right here. So one large reservoir uh, gives us all of our fuel. Back here is your def tank. We move the variators from the back right corner for the rotors to the other side of the combine. So all the drives except for threshing and your cleaning fan are now over on the left hand side. And we'll look at that when we get over there. Um, up here on the top, you got your fountain auger drive chain. And it's got a spring-loaded tensioner, same as we've always had on the combines. Uh, the, the tolerance uh, indicating that it's time to change is five millimeter. So that's the thickness, roughly the thickness of the wrench. So up here on the top, you've got at the end of the tube, you got your spring, you got a tube, and you got a bolt on the end. The gap between the bolt head and the, sp the, the washer on the top of the spring should be at five millimeter. It's, that's when, when it reaches that, it's time to change that. And we have two more chains on the left side that'll be easier to see for the unloading 
you can, I'll show you that when we get over there. It's identical to this chain right here. So when you get down to five millimeter, you might, it's time to start thinking about changing those chains. Now another thing, uh, a maintenance point, all the indicators on all your belt tensioners are now tip to tip. So you don't have some that are overlapping, small coils aren't overlapping, they're tip to tip now, just like the large coil are tip to tip. So that's gonna make things very consistent when we're looking at the tension, they're all the same. There's a couple over there, cage tensioners, but they're very easy to, uh, to tell also. Uh, but as far as all these belts right here, they're all the same on both the left and right hand side. So that'll make life a little easier for you. Now this is the advanced chopper, formerly known as the turbo chop. So on that yellow combine, that 750 over there, it has the turbo chop. That's the predecessor to this one. This one is mechanically driven versus hydraulically driven. And the reason why we went with mechanical drive, we did that back on the 700 series, late 700 series. The reason why we went to mechanical drive is because it's a whole lot more efficient and you get a lot more power to drive, especially when you're cutting 40 foot or 45 foot of green stem beans going down in there. So sometimes on the hydraulic driven ones, you'll see them running and then they get loaded up one side with heavy green residue. One will slow down relative to the other one and then it'll narrow up your spread pattern. Get a very inconsistent spread pattern. By going mechanical, it's a lot more efficient. You're getting a lot more power to the spreaders to keep things flowing better. Now this chopper has the tailboard, has hydraulic cylinders in here, no electric motors that control the center deflectors. So the lower the tailboard, there's a four position tailboard, the lower the tailboard, the wider it spreads. And then you nudge it out and in, fine tune it with the center deflectors. So, so if this one's in this, so it's in the all the way up position now. So think of this about 30, 35, 40, 45, roughly. And then you can fine tune it right here in the center. If you need to nudge it out closer to the standing crop or if it's blowing into the standing crop, you need to nudge it back in. You can do that from the cab. Up here on the side, you see the, the wind sensors or the slope sensors. So if the combine, if you have a strong wind coming from the south, blowing to the north, what it's gonna do is it's gonna cause that right deflector to move out farther to direct more material into the wind. If the combine is leaning to the left, and this moves out, it's gonna tell the left one to go far, to extend leftward and blow more uphill to make sure that you've got a good even distribution of material behind the combine. So with the hydraulic cylinders, we can do that. The old, uh, the old version, the previous version of the electric motors are in here. Um, a lot of folks just unbolted those and weren't using them. Uh, but now with the cylinders that are in there, you can, you, you can have this feature on here. So it works really well. So just remember that lower you go, the wider it goes. So all the way down for 45, 40, 35, and roughly 30. Think of it in those increments. And then fine tune it with the center. So the rear belt back here runs the spreaders. We do not change its position or its pulley set. We do that on this belt right here behind this shield. So right now, we've got the small pulley running the large pulley, which means it's on, on slow. If I need to change that, I can detension it and run it over to the other pulley set. So right now the chopper is on high, the spreaders are on low. When I, and that, that would be my setting for beans or wheat. When I wanna go to corn, I can run it in low and low. Say if I'm running a eight row corn head, um, I can run it low and low. I can also bump this to high and run the chopper on low and the spreaders on high in order to get out to a 30 foot or 40 foot header. The one speed I do not do is I don't go high and high. That's too fast for any of the headers that we offer. Um, and you'll get an alarm in the cab that goes off if you go too fast back here. There's never been a need to go high and high. High and low. Um, has been, the, uh, has been the, the fastest we've needed to run these, uh, these spreaders. Now, the thing to remember is the chopper is running the spreaders, so that's why I'm saying high and low or high or low and high and back here is because the, the chopper drive that runs the drum also runs the spreaders, so, and the spreader is the speed that I can shift between high and low just like the chopper, so we can always dial into the optimal speed range that we need. 
Okay, coming off the engine gear case up here, the series of pulleys, on the end of the pulley is a hydraulic clutch uh, for a soft engagement of the processor. Uh, so the processor engages very much like the feeder house does. The far inside belt is the new main power band that runs the rotors and the chopper and the feeder house. The second belt that comes, it's in there, is the three rib belt that runs the threshing, that drives the counter shaft that goes to the right side that runs the threshing. And then the one on the outside is the stage one belt for the unloading system, that runs continuously. And then the stage two will engage whenever I engage the processor. Uh, so your tensioners for the, the stage one unloading drive is the cage tensioner up above the, it's idler up on top. And then the other tensioners are hydraulic, so we don't have to do any adjustment uh, for the belt tension. It's done automatically by the hydraulic cylinders that you see up there. So that's less adjustments that the operator will have to do. Inside the toolbox here, I mentioned earlier, there's a nice storage compartment right here that you can put some component wearables wearables or losables. So you got your indentation here for your chopper knives on both the left side and the right side. You've got the indentation for knife guards. You can stack two on each side. Actually you can turn them over, get probably four in there. You got areas for sickle sections and hardware and maybe even a, a, an auger, a, a, a retractable tine for your, uh, your auger. So you can put plenty of parts right in here. That's what this storage is for right there so uh, still got your toolbox um, we took out some of the tools we don't have all the tools in there like we did a lot of them were just kind of useless inside there uh, here is your here is your apparatus your hose your gauge and your valve if you do have to detension and reinstall new belts it's either there for you guys to use or for you're ready to go for your technician most technicians already have one uh, this cable right here this just lets you, this is used uh, when needed to shoot 12 volts into a, a solenoid. For example, if, you, if you're unable to get the transmission to shift from the cab for what may have a problem down there and you need to get the combine moved, this is what we can use to put 12 volts into one of the solenoids to force it to shift. Right here is the applicator for the auto lube system. So right here, this is the fastest way to fill that with grease it holds 18 roughly 18 tubes of grease and this is your applicator many of you have already seen these and uh, so you just put your tube in here and just smash it right into the right into the reservoir it just screws right on or just fits right into that uh, port right there and just force it right in there uh, it works a lot faster than trying to feed it in there with a uh, with a bolt greaser So up here on the front, you can see I got the concave open, and that section right there, that is the, uh, that's the one section you can swap out. All you need is your combine wrench, it's an 8 to 8 millimeter bolts to loosen up, and get that gib key puller, that's that triangle piece of steel that's in your toolbox, that works great for going in the little slots in there and just prying up on it. And then once I pry up on it, I'll stick my wrench underneath there to hold it so I can put my finger, hands on there and slide it right out over the tracks. It takes 10 minutes to do that. Uh, it does help to have somebody either pick up or step down on that belt to give you a little more clearance. But other than that, that's the, that's the hardest part about changing it. Now, again, most of you won't change that. You'll keep it in round bar for corn and beans and wheat and, you'll, and you won't change it. But if you, happen to, if you happen to want to change it for whatever reason, that's how you change it, and we do have different great types in there for it. Now, right here is that lever or rotary handle for your cover plate. Right now it's closed. Uh, you'll see it pop down. So now it's open. There you can see the back edge of it. So now it's open. When the handle is vertical, it's open. When it's horizontal, it's closed. Corn, I want that open. And soybeans and wheat, I'll probably close it. Dry beans, I'll probably open it back up, but tough green stem beans, you might have to close it. Wheat, I'd also close it with round bar. <coughs> you can keep it open if you use a large wire or a small wire in there for wheat, 
but with the round bar in there, it'll, you'll get better performance with it closed in wheat. So that's the, uh, that's the new threshing, uh, new concave front segment right there. So but, uh, anyway, moving right up here to the left front corner of the feeder house, and then we'll be, we'll be complete and we'll open it up for questions. Oh, I do want to talk about the header. So on top here is your dust suction fan. Here's your belt for your dust suction fan down here. Now this dust suction fan, this is a, it's a much larger housing. It doesn't, it's not going to get a build up of debris like the one on the 700 series had. So if, if uh, so I don't recommend ever cutting this belt. You know, in the past when that one would plug up, they just get tired of cleaning it out, so they just cut the belt. Don't cut this belt. We've had people do that already. This belt runs the pump that circulates the, the oil through the oil cooler for your feeder house drive. So don't cut this belt. You don't want that drive to go out. Uh, that drive is critical, and you don't want that drive to go out, so don't, uh, don't cut that belt. That was something that was sometimes done on the yellow combines. We don't want to do it on this combine. You're not going to have to because that one's not going to plug up. Um, that one's going to large housing, tw almost 12 inches in diameter. Uh, you got a large fan on the end that's blowing everything out the right-hand side. We won't have to worry about that. It keeps all that dust from, from uh, getting, in your, getting in your line of sight. We also have another fan up here on the top, a blower. Uh, we had some shaft left over, so we put a blower fan up there that cleans the top of the feeder house off so that you don't have to... Uh, so you don't get that, that pile of material built up up there on the top. It just blows that all off the, uh, the top of the feeder house. The fundamentals are still the same. You have your dynamic cooling system. We treat it the same, similar air filters as we've had before. Uh, just a, like I said, a different brand of engine. Uh, inside the grain tank are steps that take you right down. You don't have to take a ladder up there. You get steps that allow you to step right down in there. This grain tank, the 510 bushel, you'll just need to make sure your tip tops are folded down so you, unless you're really long legged and can step up over those, otherwise uh, just fold those down and then you can step right down inside that grain tank. Handle, steps, bring you right down inside there. On the yellow combines, we used to have a way to unplug that combine when it would plug. We had detension the, uh, the, the, the impeller pulley and then we'd take the door off, blow the cab, kick the processor on, and most of the time it'd throw the slug out on the feeder house. We don't have to do that on this one anymore. Uh, one, because it's probably not gonna get plugged up. We've got the feature called auto crop flow. We had it on those combines, it was an option. Then we standardized it late in the C7s, and it's standard on all of these combines here. And what auto crop flow does, it's an overload prevention system, is it's utilizing the sensors that are already on the combine. So you got an APS cylinder speed sensor, a threshing speed sensor, and an impeller speed sensor. You've got your chopper speed sensor, your rotor speed sensor, and your engine speed sensor. Um, and it's looking at all those speed sensors and it's gonna detect that moment just before it stalls to kick the header and feeder house off and apply all that power to the processor. If your cruise pilot is on, it's gonna slow you to one mile an hour to get your attention to stop. If you're unloading on the go, it's gonna shut your unloading tube off automatically. So, and that's gonna, and then at the same time, it'll kill the header and feeder house. It'll apply that brake so it doesn't wind down and pack in the feeder house and apply all that power to the, uh, to the processor to clean itself out. It'll do the same thing to the chopper. Late in the season, you've got worn out chopper knives, you're getting close to the end, you got some tough green crop you're harvesting, you may have overloaded the chopper and it sensed that and your header and feeder house shut off. And it'll put all that power to clean the chopper out. Uh, so that is a great uh, uh, system that safeguards the combine, gives you the peace of mind of knowing you're not gonna have to unplug it, get in there and dig it out. Um, the only time I found a, com uh, a new combine with auto crop flow that is plugged somebody has turned it off. Now on this combine, why they've turned it off is because auto crop flow is on the same page in the screen as CMOS auto. So some folks that decide to turn CMOS auto off, they've turned off auto separation, auto cleaning, and then they see auto crop flow. Well, it says auto, let's turn it off because it must be part of CMOS auto. 
Well, it's a standalone feature. And so usually when I've ever heard one of these of plug, you know, if I've been around it, I always look in there and it's off. So don't turn that off, leave it on. Leave it set to medium sensitivity. High, if uh, you're really in tough conditions or you got a really novice operator on there, or low, if uh, you're very confident, but medium is a great setting to put on and you're not gonna plug it up. It's not gonna let you do that. Unless something terribly wrong takes place on the combine, breaks, it's, it's gonna keep you from plugging up. And it's designed to do that. I mean, the technology is there to do that. Now, it'll, it might startle you the first time it goes off when you're harvesting along and you get in some really, I don't know, some really tough green high moisture corn and all of a sudden you just, your head goes off and you just drive over standing corn. Well, that's auto crop flow went off. Rarely does it go off in corn unless the sensitivity is too high, um, but uh, usually it's in more denser crop, stem or straw crop, so. Dual knife drives are standard on this header. The only one that gets a single knife drive is the 30 foot, but the 35, 40, and 45 all get dual knife drives, and literally, you can attack a field, square up the field, fill every sickle section with, an, with, a, with a stem, and just keep right on trucking right in the field without stalling your cutter bar. To tension your belts on this header, that's really easy. I've got a no tools required tensioner. So right now, if I get down here and look, I can see the tooth is not in the green zone, which means that uh, on this one, actually it's a little bit tighter. So if I want to adjust that, I just detension it. And I'll back this off just a little bit. And then run it back almost, I'm, I've got her almost in line right there. Left, right, and then two on either side of the center belt is all you've got to do. No tools required. There's your shaft drive, your planetary knife drive right there. So you get a very nice smooth sewing machine-like action on your uh, cutter bar. Really quiet, less chatter that way than a wobble box. Uh, so it's a lot more efficient having that shaft driven knife drive down here. But you do have the option of headlights to go in the back sheet of the header. You can see the cutouts are here that you can remove and insert the LED floodlights. The reason we put those in there is better visibility of the cutter bar, but sometimes we know that when you're out harvesting you'll get that, you get that layer of, of dust on a humid evening that just seems to want to be right about eye level in the cab. Well, you can reduce some of the lights on the cab and use these lights down here that shine below that rather than into that dust layer, shine below it using these headlights down here. And it's a, a very popular feature. It's a nice convenient feature. Kind of gives you a better lay of the land out here, especially when you're harvesting at night in uncertain terrain. Or if you new field with some rocks you don't know about, you can see that down here on your cutter bar better with those lights, so. Once the reel is installed, it's uh, you've got just some easy lever operated timing of the, uh, of the tines. So that's a lot, of, very much familiar, similar to what others use. So keeps that, keeps that simple on here, so. On the back side, now this header actually has the sensing bands that hang down for wheat. This one does have a, uh, the gauge wheels Wheels are in the, on the drapers. So you do have gauge wheels with, with, with this one. It's optional, um, especially if you're running the soybeans, you really don't need gauge wheels. Um, the 45 footers, maybe if you're cutting wheat with a 45 foot, it'll stabilize a little bit, but most of our 40s and 35s don't have gauge wheels uh, running on them uh, in, in the Midwest. So that would be an option. This has them, but uh, that would be an option for for down the road if you get if you decide to get one of these so that's all i've got